Rolling. Hello, uh, attendees of the Jazz Journalists Association's monthly webinar. We've been having a little bit of technical difficulty. I hope that's not going to continue, but you never do know. This is Howard Mandel. I'm president of the Jazz Journalists Association. I'm here with Eddie Beckton, our talk show host, radio talk show host from Los Angeles, and Jeff um, uh, Himes. Uh, Himes, Jeff Himes, I'm sorry, who's actually a good friend of mine and mine had one of those senior moments. You're sitting in the uh, luxurious uh, JJA uh, uh, headquarters in the cloud where things get a little cloudy at times, so please forgive us. Also, uh, we've had some questions about why questions and comments was a required field on the registration. We didn't do that. That's something that GoToWebinar did. So uh, don't feel pressed to uh, have questions. Uh, I don't know why that was required this time. I'm going to try to answer some or ask, pose to our panel some of the questions that you all um, wrote in those questions and comments boxes. Also, we have a question panel that is on the uh, go to webinar uh, uh, widget that you're seeing on your desktop. So you can type questions in there and I will try to get to those also. So uh, with no further ado, uh, Eddie Beckton, Jeff Himes. Eddie, let's start with you and just tell me a little bit about your background in interviewing and uh, what's entailed and where most of it's happened. Uh, a comment. First of all, thanks, Howard, for inviting me. Uh, a combination of in academia and in radio. Most of my academic experience is qualitative uh, research. So I've done a whole, I've literally done hundreds of structured interviews with uh, uh, research participants. And I've been a radio producer host uh, for the Jazz Journey for eight years. Uh, so I've been doing interviews on radio for that period of time as well as print media. I was the co-founder of uh, all the, the print version of All About Jazz Los Angeles back in, I think, 2001 or so. Uh, so I have a considerable amount of experience with uh, musicians and artists as well as the academic side, if you will. Real good. And Jeff, uh, some of your background on interviewing. Uh, yeah, well, I've been a uh, freelance music critic since 1977. I've managed to support myself uh, with that. And, uh, you know, I've written a lot about jazz since the beginning, but I've also written about other fields of music, you know, rock, R&B, country, uh, classical, whatever people will pay me for. Uh, and especially uh, as my career progressed, uh, I did fewer record reviews and more interviews, uh, and most of what I do now are uh, long-form uh, interview features for magazines and newspapers. Do you find that particularly satisfying? Uh, yeah, well, I like um, I enjoy writing longer rather than shorter because you have an idea to uh, get beyond the nuts and bolts and actually say something. Uh huh. So, um, uh, what are some of the in the nutshell that we're going to explicate uh, these uh, uh, points considerably? But in the nutshell, Jeff, what have been some of the things that you've learned about uh, interviewing during your uh, career to date. Right. Um, you know, well, one thing is when you're interviewing musicians, especially musicians who've been around a while, uh, you have to bear in mind that they've done hundreds of interviews already. And they've heard the same questions over and over again. And they, they go through a lot of these interviews on autopilot. You know, they've heard the questions. They know what the answer they're going to say is. So they don't really think about what they're saying. You know, it's like pushing a button. They give you the answer. And so the first challenge, I think, in doing it when you're interviewing uh, a veteran musician is getting them off of autopilot, you know, getting, finding a, a question or an approach that's going to uh, get them to turn the autopilot off and start talking to you. Is, uh, Eddie, what about you? Can you uh, encapsulate your wisdom? I, I could say the same thing. I, I think Jeffrey's right on point because I, I too, you, you could sometimes you could sense it. The, the the interviewer, the interviewee, they've heard a millions of the, you know, millions of the same questions over and over. So I think you have to. It may sound trite, but you know, try to develop unique questions. And I think it starts with doing your homework. Know your subject inside and out so that you'll be able to come up, uh, hopefully, with some unique questions. 
but they've heard many of the same questions. I think what I like to do is, I'll never forget, I interviewed Marcus uh, Miller once, and I asked him, I said, you know, often, he's been millions of times people have, have asked him how did Miles Davis influence him. So I flipped it around. I said, you know, how, what did Miles Davis learn from you? And he said, you know, I've been doing these interviews ad nauseum all my life, you know, virtually all my life, and nobody's ever asked me that question. And he said, that's a good question. And, you know, I've asked a few people, like I've asked Charlie Hayden that. So I think sometimes, to it, it, it at least has helped me to take the onus off the musician and find out uh, uh, how, how, not only how they've influenced other people, but uh, the, the inverse as well. So I think coming up with these unique questions uh, as best as, po as possible, but it starts with knowing your subject. I, I, yeah, I'd like to jump in there and say, you know, it is right that doing your homework is important, and it's also, you know, it's, you, you need to keep in mind that the musician is usually doing the interview to promote whatever their latest project is. That's what they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I find it, you know, it's, it's always better to start off an interview talking about what they want to talk about and then mm -hmm. moving mm -hmm. to what you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And, you and know, if you, if you show that you, you're familiar with their latest project and, you know, that that makes them feel like, oh, okay, well, maybe I'm spending my time usefully here. Right. I think that's a good point too, Jeffrey, because you know I I, I approach my interviews uh, as, as a giver in a sense that I'm not trying to take take take, you know, from. So I try to take you know bring something to the table. But I think Jeffrey's right on point there as well. Well, it it sounds like both of you uh, often have uh, artists that you're interviewing because there are commercial uh, purposes immediately, mm -hmm. and uh, they they are. Uh, uh, people who are steeped in the same interview process, um, mm -hmm. you also run into people who are seldom interviewed, and does that make it more difficult? I interviewed uh, Ahmad Jamal at a period where he had, for my purposes, for our purposes, taken somewhat of a hiatus from interviewing, because frankly he was, uh, he had a certain level of disdain for <laughs> the people who were interviewing him. Um, and that was probably one of the best interviews I've ever had in terms of, uh, you know, the, the 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 mindset, what people thought he would be like, you know, the information people would share with me. Um, but it was it was a really really good interview because, uh, I guess I, I, he said it was really respectful and he said he enjoyed it, and that's a to me that's a foundation too, respecting your subjects and your subject space. Uh, but he'd had a hiatus, and he said, you know, he put it all on the table. He said, I haven't done this in a while. Um, and I said, look, you know, I'm here. You have to develop that trust. Right. That's critical. Uh, so that's why I try to give something that's not about, okay, tell a, talk to me, talk to me, share this with the audience. I think having a sense of empathy helps. At least it helps me. It's also, you know, if you interview somebody who's, like, releasing their first record, Mm -hmm. You know, a, a new artist in, in that sense. Uh, they they don't have the sort of jaded uh, feeling about interviews because they haven't you know answered a million questions already. Uh, and so that, that's a that's a real plus for you as an interviewer uh, in the sense that they're more likely to open up and say things. Mm -hmm. But at, at the same time, they don't know how to do an interview, so you sort of have to take charge of the interview more firmly than you would with somebody who's done it a lot. Well, one of the one of the stories that I've had that comes to mind is when I interviewed Sonny Chris, who was certainly a veteran musician, but was definitely not used to being interviewed, and he just had like really no very little to say, and he was in a rather obviously depressed state, and you know just trying to pull out things from him uh, to to demonstrate that I was really interested, I was genuinely interested in what he had to say. Uh, that went a long way. I also want to say that I asked that question that you mentioned, Eddie. I was interviewing Jimmy Heath about mm -hmm. John Coltrane, mm -hmm. and he really did not in being he was not enjoying going through his John Coltrane stories. Right, right, right. So I did ask him, well, how did you know you and how did you influence him? Not how did he influence you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was so happy to have me turn the the, the attention back on mm -hmm. his fears opposed to talking about trains, mm -hmm. and I got from them that way. But, 
But you know, both of gents, uh, I think you, you've skipped over one of the vital uh, elements uh, that we have to do when we prepare to do interviews, and that is uh, get our equipment ready. And so oh, I want to ask you about that part of it because it's so important to everybody. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of paranoid. I take the paranoid route. When I, I never forget the one of my favorite stories is when I was in graduate school, I did this uh, a series of structured interviews with a politician. And mind you, this was a politician who had 30 years experience. So, <laughs> you know, I, I cut my teeth with that, that those experiences. Uh, and I'll never forget one time I had a tape recorder, uh, and this was early in my, my, my training. I had a tape recorder and the batteries ran out. And I had my notepad, but that taught me a lesson that, where I said I took the paranoid, paranoid route. So, I mean, th there hasn't been an interview since where I've had not had it's probably at least two recorders. Uh, and that depends, of course, if it's live, you know, my equipment that I use. But I use a nice little Sony digital recorder that's handheld, and it also connects to my computer. I can transcribe it really a lot easier. Uh, but I always keep those extra batteries. You, you can never, to me, you can never have enough equipment equipment when you're doing <laughs> interviews. Uh, is all of your equipment equally uh, high, high standard? Yes, yes. I don't, I don't com when those type of things I don't compromise on. Jeff, what's your experience that way? Well, I'm not techie, so I'm, I try to, you know, I, I try to, um, you know, when I'm even when I'm recording stuff, I try to take notes because um, you can always check spelling. You know, if I, I know if I write things down, that you know, I'm not going to have to, you know, just you know worry about things, uh, equipment going wrong or being able to hear mumbled words. You know, if I'm writing it down, I know I've got it. And I right, right. That's going to go wrong. So, how's your handwriting? Uh, you know, I use a lot of shorthand. I've gotten pretty good at it. So, right. Uh -huh. I, I was going to add that too. If uh, you know, like I said, I take the paranoid route. I'll have the 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 uh, recorders and a couple of notepads, ink pens, uh, and I learned shorthand. Fortunately, probably 30 years ago, and I still use that. So, for those uh, interviews out there who are just starting out, I strongly recommend, and even for the seasoned ones, uh, mm -hmm. to learn shorthand. That really helps me. Right. Yeah, I never took shorthand, but I, I've sort of invented my own system. That's you know, my system. <laughs> right, right. And, right. Uh, you know, it's also so that, you know, having a notepad is also good because if you if you're interviewing somebody in person, especially uh, mm -hmm. being able to write down physical description of the person mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the room and the situation, mm -hmm. um, you know, what they're wearing, what they look like, you know, it, that's invaluable in doing right. it when you're writing the interview up. And it, it, I'll ask you this, Jeffrey. I'm sure there have been times where uh, you have your, your, your interview protocol, and the interview interview may say something, and that may spark another question. Oh yeah. From you, so you got to write that down. <laughs> you know, if you just rely on your recorder, you you might be in a little trouble there. Right. You know, I mean, I think in terms of in terms of doing preparation for the interview, it, it is it's always good to have a list of questions, especially a, a couple of good opening. Mm -hmm. questions and a series of topics that you want to make sure you cover as long as you have enough time uh, but you never want to you know rattle off a, a list of questions I mean no. I had I've been interviewed myself and you know you get these especially with my college kids you know and they have question one question two question three and you know mm -hmm. that's not good interviewing you know your right. question is just to sort of create an opening that you can like then go with you know right I agree with you further. Further. Yeah. Well, one of our uh, attendees here, I think this is uh, Francina Connors, is saying sometimes you have very little uh, time to prepare uh, beyond basic information. So then, how do you how do you go? Do you use a different style when you're just uh, parachuting in and uh, have to work quickly? Well, I always try to get publicists to give me at least 24 hours. Um, mm -hmm. That's sort of you know sometimes you have to like compromise, but you know, as much as possible, you know I you know if I can spend a couple hours doing some homework, that's usually enough. But um, to 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 go in uh, naked is uh, not great. <laughs> I, I agree with you. I've been in situations where I've been asked to do interview. I, I, I'm kind of staunch in that regard. I, I, I ref to me it's disrespectful to walk into an interview on a fly like that. Uh, I mean, obviously, certain things happen. Sometimes it could be somebody flying in town. Who knows? But 
I never go into an interview ill-prepared. I'm like Jeffrey. I mean, I've got to have some time, even if it's an hour to study the subject or get a sense of a greater, uh, greater in-depth of who the person is and uh, the music they're making if it's a, if it's a musician. But uh, fortunately, I haven't been in a situation where any, somebody's called me and said, hey, you know, we've got this interview set up in 10 minutes. Can you do it? So fortunately, yeah. I haven't been in a situation. I have yeah. had those situations, and sometimes with artists that I had no idea what they were, who they were at all. Mm -hmm. um, uh, English pianist, uh, I think he's English, British anyway, uh, Keith Tippett. I was one time uh, enlisted to interview him within a half hour, and uh, I really did not know his work. And it right. was a situation where I had to say, frankly, I, I, I know you're an enormous star, and I, 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 please forgive me, I really don't know much about what you've done. And, you know, so I'm coming to you as a complete naive, but let's assume that there are also readers out there who are uh, as ill-informed as I am. So let's, please, let's start at the beginning. In that case, he was very gracious and was willing to do that. Yeah, I mean, you have to be, you have to, you, the worst thing you can do is pretend you know more than you do know, because right. you'll, you know, they'll smell that out in a minute. It'll but, come out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who have been some of your most challenging uh, interviewers? Interviewees. Jeff, I had a, you know, just there's, there's all kinds of people. You know, the worst thing is when somebody doesn't want to do the interview and their publicist sort of twisted their arm. And you know, I've had, especially in rock in the rock world, I've had that happen several times, and that's just unpleasant to, to sit through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, other times, you know. I had sort of a famous interview with Freddie Hubbard towards the end of his career when he was, you know, not in great shape, and it was uh, it was very poignant stuff, but it was it was uh, very challenging. To sort of, you know, to one of mine was with. with uh, uh, excuse me for a minute, Eddie. It was challenging <laughs> just to sit, sit with him, Jeff, or it was challenging to get what you wanted, or what? Yeah, more to get what I wanted, and. Um, you know how to how to talk about you know where he was in his career in, in a way that was tactful. I interviewed Freddie around that time too. I think he knew me a little bit. Did he know you? Uh, not really. I mean, I had interviewed him before, but it had been a long time before. So, I mean, he did things like turn on the TV. He wanted to watch basketball. He wanted to talk about anything other than really, you know, what I. Assumed was the career information that uh, sometimes I just try to wait them out, and if I spare, I mean, I think in that case I must have spent three or four hours with uh, Freddie, and he was a lonely guy at that point up in his hotel room. You know, mm. he wanted to watch basketball. I I was willing to watch with him for a while. I did have a couple other opportunities that week to talk to him, like in the recording studio, mm. and you know that really brings the question to mind: What if you don't get what you need? How, what do you do to fulfill your assignment? And and do you go in with a sense of what you need, or are you willing to say, I'm going in, I'm going to see what I get, and then the story will be what I get? Yeah, I think I that, you know, I mean, I think you, you have, if you're, if you're a music critic, you know, you have a perspective on the work. Um, but at the same time, you have to be open to where the conversation goes. You know, you can't try to, steer the conversation to a, a predetermined goal, you know, like if you want to talk about, you know, um, their equipment and they don't want to talk about the equipment, then you've got to find something else that you can talk about, mm -hmm. you know. Eddie, I think I cut you off before when you had something to say. Oh, it, it was in reference to um, uh, uh, an artist whom I had on my show before, uh, Chuck Johnson, uh, well known in the LA area. Uh, he's been doing it a number of years, but uh, and just really, initially it was really challenging because he to, to call him talkative is just is he, that's just not his thing. So uh, so it took me a couple of minutes to recognize that uh, because it was his suggestion he wanted to come on my show. Uh, so I thought that you know when when people are energetic and enthusiastic about coming on the show and take initiative. Then I tend to think that they're gonna they're gonna have a lot to talk about, and it's a matter of me trying to uh, rein them in to get them to, to be quiet. Well, it was the opposite with him in that, you know, I'd ask him some questions and even open initially. 
some of the open-ended questions, he, it was almost as if he tried to turn them into closed-ended questions where he could just say no. And so I kind of, I don't remember exactly what I did, but somehow I, I just incorporated the humor about how quiet and shy he was. And he laughed, and after that, it really opened it up. But initially, man, it was like pulling teeth, getting stuff out of this guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to find out. I mean, and that helps, too. Uh, if, 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 you, if you're in a better sense of knowing who the subject is and having a, a stronger sense of their nuances, there's certain ways you can pull them a little further out. I mean, I know him fairly well, uh, so I was okay with the way I incorporated humor in bringing him out. If I were talking to Farrell Sanders, no, probably wouldn't have done that. You know, but each personality obviously is different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's another story. It's like, you know, when I interviewed uh, John Boutet, who's a, a great jazz singer from New Orleans, and, you know, first thing I asked him is, you know, how did, you know, what was his experience with the, the with Katrina? And he immediately watched on this sort of, like, lecture about, you know, it wasn't Katrina, it was the failure of the levees, you know, and he went on this sort of rant. And, and mm -hmm. I actually, I was able to use that to sort of open up a whole bunch mm -hmm. of feelings that he had about that whole experience. So, you know, uh, you know, if you're willing, you know, if they have, like, a sort of contrary streak to them, you can sometimes use that to, like, get a, a real sort of uh, lively conversation going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I gather that you don't do any radio production or, or audio work with these interviews. Is that true? That's true. And Eddie, you don't really write articles off of your interviews very often, do you? Not anymore. I used to for uh, All About Jazz, but now I just, uh, it's no written production. Um, in fact, I, I've, I've accumulated so many that uh, there's something in me that's telling me to do something. with my, my archive mind is telling me to do something with these and put them in print somehow because I've I've done quite a few over the years. Would you think about doing them in archive web web form? You know, uh, it would be web form. I'm also contemplating put them in. You know, I don't know uh, a book form. I haven't decided yet, but they're starting to add up. Usually, if I I'll record the interviews, um, and it's just you know I've got this collection of different personalities. You know, from Bill Charlap to Nicholas Payton to you know Charlie Hayden, and each each person is different. So I haven't decided yet, Howard, how and what I'm going to do with these, because right now they're just building up in my home, and I need to do something with them to share them with the rest of the, uh, uh, the public. Um, do you transcribe the interviews? In, you know, um, type them out? not so. I don't so much anymore because I they, I haven't. They don't. There, there's no outlet for them at this point. When I was with All About Jazz, I did transcribe them. Um, and you know, as I, when I decide on what I'm going to do with the product I have now, I probably am just uh, going to enlist some uh, some students and um, give them some transcription, uh, some work for perhaps extra credit or something like that. Uh -huh. <laughs> but you know, you know that that takes a lot of time, but that, that's no fun. Jeff, do you you you're writing notes as well as recording? What right. do you do when you get home? Do you type up your notes right away or? Um, I, yeah, I try to, you know, um, you know, but you know, I keep everything. You know, I've yeah. I keep uh, files on on everybody I talk to, so that you know, sometimes you can reuse a quote as long as you identify it properly. Mm -hmm. uh, I I, I had a question, uh, basically to you, Jeff, but also to you, Howard, that that touches on when you asked about equipment. I I, I know that there's some voice recognition software out there. Have you tried any of that, Jeff? Uh, no. Okay. You, Howard? I haven't either. Okay. Um, All right. It, it, I get a it, lot of emails of about that. I just don't trust it like I trust myself. Well, you'd have to go over it. But one of the things yeah. about voice recognition software is that it gets used to your voice. Right, right, and right. And it gets better the more you work with it. But if you were to introduce other people's voices, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think that it would adjust well. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I've... I kind of like transcribing, I've got to yeah. admit. Uh, really? I find that it really uh, reinforces for me what happened in the interview. Mm. And it gives me a very close feeling for the uh, vocal uh, stylings of mm -hmm. the interviewee. Mm -hmm. And I, I find that very useful in creating articles. Um, right. And, and also, I do radio production also from some of these interviews. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's crucial for that. Right. Um, 
since I'm not doing those interviews live, and they're usually heavily edited. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I, I think about what do you, what is your purpose when you go in to do the interview? Are you trying to capture a a, a snapshot of this person? Are you trying to help them out by like exposing information about their new project? Jeff, that seemed to be what you were. Yeah, I I think that you know for me I'm, I'm you know I'm very clear myself about what my purpose is as a music journalist. You know, I'm not writing for the artist. I'm not writing for the record company. I'm not writing for my editor. I'm not writing for my advertisers. My sole primary, my primary purpose is for the reader. I'm trying Yay. to, <laughs> trying to create something that the, you know, non, the non music biz, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, sort of committed uh, lover of music will be interested. That will like tell them something they don't already know. Mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. will like create, a, you know, a, a new way of, you know, uh, of, you know engaging with the music and that, you know that's what I'm I'm there for and you know I'm, I'm trying in, in a way I'm a surrogate for all those readers who would like to talk to you know Pat Metheny or mm -hmm. you know Jason Moran that mm -hmm. you know I can ask them questions that they might want to ask I can you know try and get out information that they want to get out mm -hmm. so you're yeah. kind of a mediator like a media user a mediator wow I like that Jeff that's really that's that's what we're trying to push. Yeah, you know. but then it, at the same time, you know, I think that as a journalist, especially as a critic, that you're not, you know, just a an impartial observer. That you're you're an artist too, and you're you're trying to create an experience for the reader that's as stimulating as, hopefully, as stimulating as the music itself. That mm -hmm. you know, you're trying to you know provide an insight into the creative process. Uh, that uh, is both has both intellectual content, but also has sort of you know emotional, sensual content. It's the same way music does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, uh, one, uh, answering the question for me, it it it, it depends. I, I'm with Jeffrey in the sense that to me, it's all about the audience and whatever you know, whomever I'm interviewing and whatever format it is. Uh, but the reason I say it depends. For, for example, sometimes, because I, I should note that KXLU, uh, we are a, a, it's an independent station. So I have the flexibility to do essentially whatever I want to as long as it, it is within the confines of the FCC that my uh, 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 commercial radio friends, they have no flexibility, they have none compared to what I do. So I have the flexibility, when I, get, when I meet some young kids in L.A., uh, high school kids who or playing some Duke Ellington, I can, and I have, I can invite them on my program, man, to perform, or uh, actually to interview. Uh, so I have that, so in that sense, it's all about helping them get their names out there, as well as letting the community know about this young group. Uh, if it's the case where some, some seasoned veteran, again, like Jeffrey, it's still about the, the audience, the listeners out there, uh, so I, I don't really navigate well if a publicist calls me and say, "Hey," uh, and really tries to influence me uh, or influence the interview. Uh, oh, that doesn't, yeah, that doesn't go over very well. So I'm always trying to uh, uh, ask the questions, like you know, like he, like Jeffrey said, the intermediary, if you will, between uh, the audience and the artist, uh, and that's how I approach it. But when, it, when I've got some young people out there, it's oftentimes to help them uh, get on the air that they would, opportunities, to give them opportunities they would never get on commercial radio. Uh -huh. So I so do a fair amount of that as well. That's sort of community uh, oriented. Uh, right, right. That's a nice thing. Uh, James Hale, our friend up in Ottawa, and JGA member, comments, a friend has a great way to use voice recognition software to do transcriptions. He plays the interview through headphones and repeats the words into his voice recognition software. Ah. Uh, that seems like a lengthy procedure, but you know, I, I suppose that could work, sure. Um, mm -hmm. Also, George Rivera is asking, what equipment do I use? And currently, I'm using a Tascam uh, PCM recorder, which I like pretty well. Um, and uh, the sound is great, and the interface is um, large, so I can see it even in dark spaces. 
and uh, I've been enjoying using that. I had been using an M Audio micro track, which I hated. Uh, I could never tell whether the thing was really recording or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've used everything from cassette recorders. Recently, I've been using just as my backup my telephone, my my smartphone, and mm -hmm. I'm finding that um, microphone, the recording equipment, whatever it is, the app, is is superb. You know, right, it's, right, right. it's as good as this uh, seven hundred dollar Tascam, actually. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I, that's what I'm using for backup most of the time now. Mm -hmm. But uh, gee, I, I putting speaking the words uh, that that really is um, getting deep into the mind of the uh, of the interviewee. If you're repeating back what he's been saying to you, that's kind of intense. And James says also that regarding equipment, he now uses an iRig microphone plugged either into his iPhone or his iPad. Radio quality sound and actually excellent digital file transfer. And it, again, that's the great thing about using the digital uh, recorders because you can just uh, drag the uh, files into your computer so the, it lives there. <laughs> you don't have to worry about something going wrong with your uh, recorder and losing a digital file. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, technology is working for us to some extent there. Right. But, okay, so what about, um, we've talked a little bit about the interviewer who is not talkative. Uh, well, we've talked a little bit about the problem of the interviewee who talks too much. <laughs> um, let's let's get a little deeper into this interviewee who tells the same stories you've read elsewhere. How do you how do you shake them up? What do you what do you do to get a new quote? Yeah, whenever somebody's you know somebody's like you know rattling off a cliche or making a vague statement, I say you know I try to say well what does that really mean? You know when you say you know the you know I borrow from tradition, you know, who, you know, how, what, you know, you, you know, it's like, that's what I was trying to say earlier, is that, you know, you have a, a prepared question, but that's just a sort of opening, you know, and mm -hmm. when people are being vague or, you know, as musicians often are when they're talking about music, you know, you've got to, you have to push them to be more specific about exactly what they mean. Mm -hmm. And then you can, like, sometimes I'll just say, uh, depending on how it's going, I may say, "All right, uh, tell tell my audience something that 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 they don't that, that they haven't read or heard yet." And every time I've done that, it actually worked. It's worked <laughs> at least so far. <laughs> and, it, and 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 the way the way it comes across is uh, kind of non-threatening, so they don't get pissed off and you know feel like I'm challenging them. You know, and I don't mind challenging them. Uh, but every time I've done it like that, uh, kind of in a light-hearted way, it seemed to work. What about that challenging, though? Do you, have you ever mm. found that you really have to confront an interviewee with hard questions and, you know, really challenge them and say, you know, I don't believe that, or, uh, uh, you know, I really want to take you to task on this, or this is, you know, this is a difficult problem, and we should, I, you know, do you confront people with their hypocrisy or their uh, uh, evasions or their... Uh, uh, I don't know what. You know. Yeah, I I think it's really dangerous to sort of confront people because you don't want them to just shut you off. Shut down. You can't, yeah. you can't afford for them to stop giving you useful information. So you know you can say, well, you know, a lot of other people have said that you know this what you're <laughs> what you're doing doesn't make sense. You know, how do you respond to those other people? You know, that, I find that's useful. You don't want them. Um, as much as possible, you don't want them, to, you know, getting mad at you, and then just sort of shutting up. That's the thing that you, you don't want to have happen. Right. Well, can can you build to that if you know that you're going to go there eventually in the uh, interview, so that you you get the basics out of the way, you get the yeah, information. No, and you, and you, it, you know, you, you know ahead of time what are going to be the, the difficult questions. You know, you know. What were you doing when you got caught in that crack house? You know, that's the kind of question you want to say to the end of the interview. <laughs> have talking about drugs been a sensitive topic in interviews for either of you? Mm, I don't think it. I don't. In fact, mm, I'm trying to go through the whole. No, it hasn't. Uh, I'll keep thinking about it, but uh, off the top of my head, I don't think so. Jeff, have you ever been yeah. in a situation where that's come up? Yeah, you know, 
people are, don't want to talk about certain things, you know, and you can, like, you have a sense that you can push them so far mm -hmm. without it's sort of like, uh, you know, about, you know, working against your own purposes. Mm -hmm. Now, same thing about, you know, you know, personal lives, you know, girlfriends, wives, husbands, whatever, you know, one thing is that I always, uh, I always try to think, you know, why are we talking to these people? You know, mm -hmm. it, it, their, their personal lives, a, a music, famous musicians, the personal life of famous musicians is really no different from the personal lives of anybody you know, you know, whether it's your college roommate or the guy who works down in the hall from you at work or the person at your gym, you know, off stage, but just like anybody else. And the reason that we're talking to them is because they make amazing music. And I always try as much as possible to focus on the, the making of music because that's what makes them interesting, not the fact that, you know, they had a drug problem 10 years ago or they, you know, were married to a, a you know, a model. Well, I'm thinking about my, one of those late interviews with Freddie Hubbard, though, where he wanted to talk about his illnesses. Mm -hmm. He wanted to talk about having come back from, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, drug excessive use and things mm -hmm. like that. I really didn't want to go there with him very much, but I felt like I had to let him talk about that. Again, that was a situation where I had a lot of time with him, so uh, okay. I can afford well, Yeah, I mean, you can let, you can let him talk about whatever they want, except, you know, of course, time constraints become an issue, but you know, that doesn't mean you have to put it, that's what we, uh, what, what they talk about, what you write about are two different things, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, are, are there particular tricks that you use to, or not tricks, but techniques, to put a subject at ease, do you come in uh, on time? Do you bring them a gift? Do you uh, let them know uh, what you do know about them already? Do you compliment them a lot? Uh, these kinds of things. Um, I like to when I'm doing when, when somebody's actually in the studio actually comes to the studio. Uh, I like to, or not like to, but I do let them know or remind them I appreciate their time. Uh, so, like, for example, I had uh, Jenny and Monica Mancini on uh, before, and they came to the studio. So when they came, uh, we really did it up. I had some, a lot of refreshments for them, flowers. I mean, the whole shebang. So Michael White came on recently. I know he's a vegetarian. So I had all these beautiful, this beautiful ve vegetarian dish and pomegranate water, the whole thing. Uh, so I like to, to, to remind, and I'll give them some cake, sell you goods, that type of thing. So I like to remind people that I appreciate the time uh, that they that they're taking out even if it's a an interview over the telephone in another city I always try to uh, give them something uh, in terms of when they come in uh, we'll do a walk through sometimes through the studios to kind of get them to relax but I rarely just let somebody come right in and go right to the booth and start talking uh, it's to me it's important to let to give people some time to get in the moment and in the space and get into relax so I don't I'd never just start firing off questions how was your day how was the trip over here you know just some things to get them to kind of get in the mood do you pre-interview people at all do you say this is what I'm going to be talking about and these are a couple of the questions I have and you do that always I, I don't think up in, in eight years at least on the radio in eight years I don't think I've ever done that uh, I've had people try to ask me, uh, what are you going to ask me? I always tell them, and, and this, is, this is absolutely true. Uh, to a certain extent, I like to keep the interview organic. So I may write down you know, just a handful of questions, but sometimes I never get to those. I like the interviews to just come out organically, which that's different from if I, now, when I was doing print, then I would have more, you know, more structure, if it will. Uh, if you will, but um, I, I never tell people in advance what I'm going to ask them. I don't think I've ever been, I've been asked a few times, but I always tell them, you know, we're just going to let it flow, even though I have an idea of what I'm going to get at. Jack, yeah, you yeah. find that uh, publicity fun. The one thing, you know, from interviewing people over all these years, you know, you get the sense from a lot of musicians that they talk to a lot of people who don't know much about music or uh, them, 
or the artists themselves, and just showing them that you know something in the mm -hmm. first few questions, you know, that helps a lot because it, it shows that, you know, uh, that you know what you're talking about. You know, if you could like just sort of like drop some little detail about their latest record or their career, just to let them know that, you know, you, you've done some homework and they don't have to like, you know, it's not, you know, jazz for dummies or, or whatever. Um, that helps a lot. On the other hand, sometimes it's it's good to act a little dumber than you really are because you you want you know musicians a lot of times say, well, you know what I mean, and I say, you know, if you act a little bit dumber, you know, then you say, well, explain it to me. I don't quite understand, you know, because what you you know what you want is not to understand it, but you want them to say it in words that you can put into your article. Right. Mm -hmm. So what about that? I mean, well, let me ask you, first of all, uh, Jeff, have you had um, uh, publicists who are trying to filter the questions and who are sitting with you uh, during interviews or anything like that? Are you getting pressure from them, especially with uh, rock people and pop people? It seems. Yeah, you know, uh, um, of course, a lot of stuff I do is over the phone, so that's not an issue. But, um, you know, when I'm doing stuff in person, sometimes the... the uh, Publicists will want to sit in, and, and you know, I don't, I don't. I certainly don't encourage it, but I don't make a big deal about it. I just sort of, you know, ignore them. Yeah. Um, you know, publicists will say, you know, do this, do that. You know, I, I just ignore all that. Mm -hmm. I'm you made me think, Howard. Um, there is what I will do. Oftentimes, is I'll send out an email either to the publicist or sometimes directly to the artist and say to give them an, an idea of my interview style. Uh, and I never, well, well, I rarely tell them what the questions are, I, I, you know, tell them what the type, you know, sometimes we'll just do the obligatory biographical questions uh, just to get that out of the way if people want to know, but uh, I had an interview, it was um, the publicist for Ahmad Jamal, and uh, they were asking, you know, what, what types of questions, and, you know, so I, shared my, I, said, I shared my perspective, and uh, the, the publisher said, you know, the only thing we'll, we'll just ask you to do is, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but don't ask any dumb questions like, you know, what does he think about the Iraq war, stuff like that. And I said, you know, I said, you kidding me. He said, you know, they, so he's had, so he's, he, he's shut out for a while because people were asking him questions about that, about, you know, Islam and, and Christianity and which is best and all these types of things, which, had, at, which uh, Jeffrey made reference to earlier which have absolutely nothing to do with the music he produces. Uh, so again, he came, I think he came into the interview uh, with his guards up, and rightfully so, but at the end of it he said he had a lot of fun, that was one of the best he's ever had. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was the closest in terms of someone trying to uh, not necessarily dictate the questions I would ask, but wanted to get a sense of thematically what I was going to ask. But he was very gracious. That was one of the best I've had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the transforming of the oral uh, experience in the writing process? I mean, I guess this is more for, for Jeff and me. Um, do you take liberties when you've done the interview when you're writing? Do you edit for content, for grammar? Do you transpose statements when they occur? Is that ethically problematic as far as you're concerned? You know, I think that it, it, it's tricky. I mean, you, you you absolutely have to remain true to what the person said. Uh, but you know, if you if you just printed what people actually say to you in an interview, you you would make them look stupid. Because when people talk and they're searching for words, you know, that there's us and os and they repeat themselves and they stop and start and you know, I mean, if you wanted to be you know, 100 percent accurate. You would make the your interview subjects look like idiots, and that's not fair to them either. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when I did when I did uh, interviews uh, for print format, uh, I, I took that same approach. You know, doing the editing, and it, and I think the, the 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 musicians they felt very well. I know they felt comfortable with it too, because you know, like as Jeffrey alluded to, if you printed verbatim. It generally would not cast a great light on on many of the artists, and it's not because they're intelligent or not, uh, the, their level of intelligence. It's just that when people when we communicate, 
uh, in a relaxed form. It's a lot different. Right. Yeah, I've had I've had well, musicians say to me, you know, yeah, put this in in, in English for me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of that, what do you do when uh, have you had experience with uh, interviewing people who are not English speakers, that's not their first language. Oh, I, one of my favorites was, uh, this was a couple of months ago, Chucho Valdez. He speaks no English. Uh, and uh, um, I had an interpreter, a friend of mine, she's actually from Cuba, uh, uh, Havana Carbo, she's out on the East Coast. And she interpreted, uh, did the interpretation for us. Uh, and we had a ball. And this, going back to some of the points we made earlier, in terms of making the interviewers feel comfortable. So I asked him, I said, you know, you come from a family of, of iconic musicians. Uh, what might your life look like were you not a musician? I know it's hard for you to imagine that. But what might you, you know, what, what, how might the, the, the direction of your life uh, uh, change in any way? And, you know, Chucho has this thunderous laugh. And he you know, bursts out like Jeffrey Holder. He says, uh, so the interpreter starts laughing. And I said, okay, what'd he say, what'd he say? And he said that he would have been a prize fighter, and he would have been so good that he would have beat up Muhammad Ali. Right? <laughs> so we all started laughing. I said, please, so then I say, well, tell him that I'm glad that he became a pianist, uh, so now we have him and we have Muhammad Ali instead of the other. And so he turns it back there, and then he bursts into this. So that was so much fun. Uh, I interviewed another, uh, a guy, Igor Bootman, who was a saxophone player from Moscow, yeah. Uh, that one was kind of semi-challenging. His, his English, like sometimes uh, we had an interpreter there to help out a little bit, but it turned out to generally uh, to, to work out okay. But he had a strong Russian accent. But it was he spoke just enough English. It was I think it was right at that threshold where the listeners were able to understand. But uh, but periodically we'd have a, a person alongside to kind of help out and, and, and translate for us. Jeff, what are some of your stories about this? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I've done it a few times. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a challenge. To, it's really hard to develop rapport with an interviewee if you're going through a translator. Um, and it's very hard to follow up on questions the same way you can with somebody who speaks English. Um, you have to rely more on your writing skill to frame the quotes more than you would mm. in a regular interview, I think. I, I found I had pretty good uh, luck with uh, Gonzalo Rubicalba um, mm. inter interviewing him through uh, translators. I wasn't mm. sure that I was getting the richness of the language that I think Gonzalo was uh, expressing himself in. Mm. But he and I were able to establish rapport past the the translator. Uh -huh. Right, right. But I had a, I'm sorry, go ahead. It was in person, though, right? Yeah, that was in person. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, trying to interview somebody on the phone through a translator, that seems foolhardy. Um, so well, that, that's what my with Chucho was, and it actually worked out. Wow. Uh, because I think in part, uh, before we, uh, and I put it in quotes, Hello? officially start, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hello. Uh, Hello. Uh, uh -oh. So we got. Uh-oh. Joanne? Uh, I'm hearing Jeff. You aren't hearing him. Hello. I can hear him. I hear him too. Jeff, you can't hear us. He's not hearing us. Oh dear. Um, uh, but going to the, with with Chucho, we did it by phone, and uh, so I had the interpreter. You know, again, she and she uh, knew his work, uh, and she helped to to establish that rapport before we got into the meat of the interview, uh, because he was in New York at the time, and he was going to be in Los Angeles the following week, but he didn't have time. His schedule didn't permit him to actually come on my show uh, prior to the performance while he was in St. Uh, St. Louis, in Los Angeles. But it actually worked out very well. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but I think that uh, with his persona and I think that the, the interpreter I had, who was an excellent interpreter, I think those things help, but generally I would not necessarily recommend that unless you've got a really, really good interpreter and your interpreter uh, has a strong understanding of the subject uh, and the subject's music or, you know, uh, art, art form, whatever he or she may uh, indulge. Is Jeff back on now? I see Jeff, can you, can you hear okay, us now? Great. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah. 
I, I've got to tell you about some of my experiences with non-English uh, speakers. And these have been, I, I, I just don't understand sometimes why they set me up with these. Once uh, Thomas Mufungo, who mm -hmm. is a uh, African, uh, kind of an African reggae artist but from Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. and he was sent over to my apartment to have dinner with me. And he spoke no English, and I don't know what the language of Zimbabwe is, but I didn't have any. And it was like we sat there and we ate and we smiled at each other. That was so frustrating. It was such, and they couldn't find anybody he was interested in. You know, they didn't know who to turn to. They, I don't know. I guess I was writing for Ear Magazine at the time. We did a lot of uh, uh, unusual things, or maybe it was rhythm music, but it was just impossible to get anything. Also, Hermeto Pasquale. I was assured, oh, I would understand Hermeto. Mm -hmm. and I take it back to the back room of SOBs, the club on, uh, in the village. And I could understand him, and he could understand me. But mm -hmm. I couldn't get anything that I could write. I mean, it was all wink, winks and body language and, right, right. you know, that sort of stuff. <laughs> and I had a similar situation with Carlinos Brown uh, the, uh, uh, from Sao Paulo. And I, again, I didn't know his music, and I was called up by his uh, representative in the States saying, oh, you've got to come over. You're just going to love him. He's going to love you. This is going to be so great. And I got there, and we just didn't have anything. We didn't even have visual rapport. We could not connect at all. It was so frustrating. Um, and I don't know what they expected out of that. In the case of the Hermeto interview, that was a fairly short piece for Downbeat, and I ended up mostly writing about his show and describing that as opposed to trying to make it into an interview. Mm -hmm. Not you know about, about you ever, or something like that, too. Howard, do you ever do you interview people without an assignment? Yeah. Very often? And if I'm interested. Thinking? If I'm just interested uh -huh. in them. Uh -huh. And, um, I mean, I, uh, and, and realize I have a rare opportunity. Uh, also, now I'll try to do that using a video camera, if possible. Mm. Uh -huh. And uh, I like using video cameras on interviews. Um, uh, there's some problems with that because, you ha again, you have to watch your equipment to make sure that it's running. And you can't be focused on the equipment. You have to keep your eyes on who you're right. talking to. Right. Um, but if you want to get anything that's usable video-wise, kind of out of the side of your eye, you have to keep your eye on the screen also. Can that, that can get tricky. Mm -hmm. I, I want to invite our uh, uh, attendees of whom it looks like there are about 30, to uh, ask questions if they want to uh, by typing into the question box. And, uh, you know, we will try to answer anything that you come up with. Um, some of the other difficult interviewees, um, I've got to say Cecil Taylor was one of the most challenging, very difficult to tie down, uh, uh, frequently rescheduling interviews. I was going directly to him, which I much prefer to do. I'd rather get the publicist out of the way. Or in mm -hmm. Cecil's case, usually there's somebody who claims they're his manager. And there is no managing Cecil Taylor, so it's really... It's, mm -hmm. uh, so the, what, was the difficult part actually connecting, or the interview? How, how was the interview? Um, the whole thing was problematic. Um, okay. when, when I got to the place, finally, that I was pretty convinced he would show up at, Mm -hmm. He brought along uh, two musicians he'd been working with a lot, mm -hmm. which was it was Dominic Duval and uh, Jackson mm -hmm. Crow, the drummer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew that that was not Downbeat's plan. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, Cecil said, "Well, uh, these gentlemen have been working with me, and I think they're extremely important. And I think mm -hmm. you should listen to what they have to say." Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew both of them a little bit, you know, just from being around. And Jackson knew that he was that he did not want to get in the way of any interview here. Right, Dominic, right. Dominic wanted to kind of facilitate things, so that wasn't bad. But we mm -hmm. were also at a restaurant, and I think that restaurants are the worst places that you can do interviews, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. especially if you're trying to tape. The clatter is terrible. Transcribing mm -hmm. them is going to give you a headache. Then you can be bound and sure that the waiter or waitress is going to be intrusive. Mm -hmm. You know, just when you're getting in the, in the rhythm of things, they're going to come up and ask if you want another glass of this or something. Mm -hmm. That's really problematic. 
and um, it, there's so many distractions, and yeah. it's very difficult to get people to focus. Also, mm -hmm. you don't dare eat, you know, and if right. they're eating, that's that's a problem, you know. So I, I hate doing them there. But we went to do this at a restaurant that Cecil had chosen. He ordered expensive food. He smoked an entire pack of cigarettes and put the <laughs> cigarettes out in the food. Um, my equipment broke. I had to basically take notes, but even taking notes was difficult, so I had to use my brain and just mm -hmm. try to remember everything. And when I got back to my apartment, which was at that time only a couple blocks away, I was able to just pour it all out, you know, in, in longhand. Right. And so I was able to satisfy it that way. But, wow. um, and, and uh, you know, I think it was a good interview. It's in my book. Um, mm -hmm. People have said it's valuable. Um, Cecil himself is very discursive when he talks, mm -hmm. so uh, he would not really talk about technical things. He kind of turned himself on and just went, mm -hmm. and with a stream of consciousness with lots of uh, uh, references that I could follow because I, you know, know a little bit of something about um, American musical history, and he was referring to people from the 30s and, right. you know, previous set. So, I don't know. That was that was troublesome. That was, I think, mm -hmm. the second or third time I'd interviewed him. So he did know who I was vaguely, right. mm -hmm. and that helped. Mm -hmm. um, interviewing Ornette also has always been tricky. <laughs> Ornette says such wonderful things, but mm -hmm. it's like a Zen cone. You know, he bursts mm -hmm. them on your forehead, and you feel enlightened, and then you wonder what was that he said. And even if you go back to the words, and also the first time I interviewed Ornette. For Downbeat, this was in '78. Uh, uh, we were up at the Artist House Studio um, offices in New York. I'd come in from Chicago, and I was close miking him, and he didn't really like that. But we sat there for two and a half hours, inches from each other. I was so determined to get every word. <laughs> when we finished, Ornette turned to me and said, "Well, see, Howard, you could have just made this all up. You didn't have to talk." To me. And I said, "Oh." I said, oh, no way could I have cut, you know. But then when I went back to transcribe it, I found that almost every sentence he said was a zigzag. And I couldn't tell whether he was affirming something or denying it within the same sentence. He might be doing both. Mm -hmm. And it was just linguistically, I had to decide. I basically did have to make up, well, what is he saying here? I think this is the point, this whole interpretive element that, that right. you know, required me. Uh, he and I were able to establish some nice rapport, you know, over the years, and I mm -hmm. love him, just great, but um, I, I, I've got to tell you, I can't help myself. When we were in Portland, Oregon, I was doing a live interview with Ornette um, in front of the audience, in front of the theater audience, and uh, Donardo was on the stage also, uh, Ornette's son, and I thought, and Ornette said at one point, you know, Howard, the problem with language is that we don't really use the letters in language. <laughs> and I said, oh, I see. <laughs> and Ornette looked at me and said, that was a good one, Howard. That was a good one. <laughs> so that was fun. But um, what, what kind of follow-up do you, do you do, I want to ask? What do you, what do you come up with uh, after that? You read back to them. Uh, uh, only only ahead, if I'm missing. Hello. Go ahead. Yeah, I only go back if I'm, I'm missing something or if I'm unsure about some fact, um, or if I got cut off in the middle of the interview. Sometimes you know, you only get you have a good conversation going, and you know, but you know, 45 minutes or 60 minutes go by, and they have to talk, do their next interview, and then sometimes I'll ask, well, can we hear like you know, continue this on the phone sometime. So I'll do that sometimes. A lot of, you know, Downbeat and Jazz Times uh, and some other magazines, they want you to have uh, secondary interviews in addition to the primary subject, which is actually a, a useful subject, uh, a useful exercise to, you know, talk to musicians that they're collaborating with in one way or another, because it gives you different voices in the story, gives you different perspectives, and um, you know, it allows you to create, you know, um, even if you know, the interviews are done at, at very different times, different places, you know, it allows you to create a dialogue, 
conversation within the article itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, since mine is uh, broadcast, my follow-up is different. And my follow-up is essentially, you know, thank you notes or follow-up emails. So I don't, I don't have the type of follow-up to, you know, can you expound on a question we asked earlier. Um, so it's a different type of follow-up, but... Well, I think that's polite and friendly, you know, to to contact them afterwards. I don't always do it, I must say. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I've made a relationship with somebody if I've done a good interview with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I hope that they'll let me interview them again at some point. Uh, George Rivera asks, have, have any of us had experience conducting an interview and recording it via FaceTime or Skype? I haven't done that. I haven't done that I yet. I haven't done that. Okay. Um, uh, w would you consider it? Do you think that would be useful to do it on Skype? Actually, someone, I, I don't remember who it is, but I just got an email message, uh, uh, I think on Saturday or Sunday, I don't remember, uh, but somebody broached that idea. Um, but I'll, I'll consider it. I have Skype before, but not for an interview, so uh, mm -hmm. it's something I'll consider. Uh -huh. uh, Marty Kasdan, who's uh, from Louisville, said he's come in late, so he's apologized if, he's, if we've covered this a little bit. I think we have sort of referred to it, but let's go through it again. Thoughts from the panel about asking an artist his or her background even when you, the interviewer, know the background. He says that he likes to get the artist to briefly say a few words for the quotes in his piece about you know, where they came from, I suppose, or you know, very much background information, basics. If it's someone, for me, on the radio, if it's, if it's someone who's, you know, been around 30, 40 years, I will um, refer the listeners to the website. If it's, and, but, you know, so when I'm reading, if you will, my subject, I'll get a sense of where they are if they feel, if they're already feeling comfortable. So I may say something, you know, give, give us a brief, uh, uh, give us some, some quick biographical information. Tell us where you, you know, where you're from why you chose your particular instrument, and move on. But if I'm really pressed for time, I'll say, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll refer people, or I'll ask the, uh, the, the artist will refer the listeners to the website where that information is. But I try to focus on things that, uh, that, that, that you can't, that, that are not on the website. Uh -huh. You know, I, I try not to ask questions that, that are easy, that, that, the, that, the, uh, that the artist could could easily answer on the website. Yeah, I think that this is also, a, you know, uh, an aspect of being prepared for the interview. I mean, you, you don't need to ask sort of the, the basic Wikipedia kind of questions. You, know, right. you have to, the interviewee should assume that you already know that stuff. You could ask, you know, you don't need to ask, you know, where did you grow up, but you could say, well, you know, did it make a difference to grow up in Detroit instead of Chicago? And did that affect the kind of music you play? That's a valid question. Mm -hmm. and, and then when you write the story, of course, it depends on what kind of story it is. If it's like a 700-word thing on their latest album tour, you know, you don't have to recapitulate their career. But if you're doing a 3,000-word magazine feature, you, you know, your responsibility as a journalist is to, mm -hmm. you know, at least, you know, create the basics. So you, you can't assume the reader right. uh, knows everything. You know, you have to like you know, help you know help the reader out without you know allowing it to eat up too much of the the article. Do you do you feel like uh, that interviews have an element of seduction to them? <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. I mean, it, it, seduction is a loaded word, but you know, you you are trying to develop a sense of of intimacy so that they'll open up and talk some things. I, I often feel like uh, you know, it, it, after you come out of a good interview, you know, like you've been able to talk to somebody for two hours in depth, you know, sometimes it feels like a, a therapy session. Sometimes you get the feeling that artists, you know, want to talk about the creative process but don't get a lot of opportunities to because, you know, mm -hmm. when, you, when you're with your band backstage, you know, at uh, the Village Vanguard or whatever, you know, you're not going to talk about your creative process. You're going to talk about, you know, your new car or, you know, how the Knicks are doing or whatever. Um, 
but so the, this chance to like to delve into some of these issues of the creative process is for the sort for the right artist at the right time. It's it's a very welcome thing, and they they'll sort of like it's a catharsis almost. You have this sort of like intense two-hour thing, and you feel like oh, you know, we're really close friends. Well, you're not really close friends, you know, in the same way that a therapist and a patient's not aren't really close friends. But you've had this, uh, you know, this moment. You know, I, I had a connection uh, to and with Carmen, vocalist Carmen Lundy like that. Uh, she came to my show, and I, I know that, again, this is knowing your subject, I know that she loves uh, a cheese. So I had these all, I had, I had this platter of different cheeses from around the world, some wine and everything. This was before the interview. This was, you know, we were sitting down getting relaxed. And we just, it, it, and the conversation, uh, it was so organic and it, it, just like Jeffrey just mentioned. And it, it got to the point where she, uh, her publicist asked if she could come back a second time, and we did that. Uh, long story short, out of that, out of those interviews, like this kind of, this friendship type of developed, you know, and she invited me to her at holiday parties and uh, had given me, because she's also a visual artist as well, and uh, gave me like a signature painting of hers. So I think that when you, call, to me it's like cultivating these relationships. Uh, yes, you do, you, you know, you're doing the interviews, but oftentimes what I found, it is like this catharsis in the sense that, you know, I'll be, I'll have a certain list of questions sometimes, but out of that, it'll be pretty obvious that, hey, this interviewer, or this subject, you know, really wants to get something off of her or his chest. It's not necessarily anything good or bad, but you have to be flexible as an interviewer to allow that space because sometimes they want to talk about something that they haven't had an opportunity to talk with, with their band, uh, perhaps even their family, who knows. But there's these relationships that develop out of that, and that, that's one of the, the fun things for me too. Can those sometimes be uh, trying? I mean, I, I have a couple people who um, uh, have been very responsive to my interviews, uh -huh. and they keep me on their books as somebody they always want to talk to, and always mm. expect to, you know my ear to be available for them. I only had one where <laughs> I had one this particular musician. Um, it, it is kind of a, one of those heartbreaking stories. You know, he'd been around for literally decades. Uh, signed uh, contracts that he didn't really know what he was signing and uh, was not doing well financially. And, you know, we he had been, uh, let me just say this. In answer to your question, yes, because he needed, he would need some financial assistance periodically. And uh, that was, it wasn't necessarily trying, it was more painful than anything because I, I couldn't help him as much as I would have preferred but, you know, of course, the onus was on, you know, some of the choices he made in his life. Uh, so it was difficult at times trying to wean him, if you will, uh, that, that I'm not, you know, I'll, I'll help you if I'm able to financially, but, you know, do not see me as somebody you can just call up and say, uh, hey, Eddie, I need, uh, you know, <laughs> I need some money. Can you help me out? You know. I had a musician who, after I interviewed him in my living room, and uh, my daughter was very young at the time, and it was Friday, and I had to pay off both of our babysitters. And he saw me do that, and then he asked me for sixty bucks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was that was kind of awkward. Mm -hmm. so, uh, no, you know, I just cleaned out the babysitters. If you you can take care yeah. of those next week, baby. Um, there's a question here from uh, Brett Delmage, and I think he's going to have to explicate a little bit. I'll read it, and then we can go to the next uh, comment, and maybe Brett can fill this in. But he's asking us, any familiarity with or comments on John Sawatsky's interviewing techniques for difficult interviews? And then he gives us a link, a, a ESPN uh, link to a column. I, I don't know John Sawatsky, and I don't know what his interviewing techniques are. Eddie or Jeff, do you? I don't either. I'm sorry. Yeah, that name doesn't mean anything to me. So Brett, if you can like fill this in a little bit. Uh, we can maybe get to that, and I'll ask the or uh, the next comment while we're waiting to see if Brett does that. This is from D L, and he says Skype can be very useful for interviews, and I recommend interviews expa interviewers expand their reach as far as possible. There are a lot of tools out there that allow you to record both audio and video at very high quality connection willing. 
when I was a broadcaster at a station in the middle of nowhere in the British countryside, Skype gave me access to people like David Sanborn, Walter Beasley, and Robert Glasper from thousands of miles away. Mm -hmm. So that probably was true, you know, it does... Yeah. Uh, Oh yeah, I've just you know, like I said, I've been approached to do it uh, just you know within a, a few days ago, uh, but I just haven't done it yet. But I'm certainly receptive to it because it can help. If Skype works properly, it's just like a phone interview. Mm-hmm. So yeah. And Francina Connor says, I believe in exploring the music. There's so many things about the artists that may inform their music. To fully explore the music, do you interview people who are not currently in vogue or embraced by the media? that are doing things of importance to the music and still moving the music forward. For example, engineer who are well known and respected by the musicians. Or other musicians like Albert Fiedler, uh, the drummer for Kid Jordan and Muhal Abrams, who's really knowledgeable mm -hmm. about cultural history. Or Miles Davis, Duke Ellington or more today, uh, trombonist Dick Griffin, who's been mm -hmm. developing a strong reputation for a visual artist. As a visual artist, too. I, I do interview people who are not in vogue. I, I right. seldom seem to get interviews for people who are in vogue. Right. I right. try to make people in vogue with my interviews. <laughs> right. And I, I, I agree with you, and uh, I pretty much alluded to this earlier. Uh, they do not have to be in vogue on my program at all. In fact, uh, I, I like to look at my program as, as the... Um, uh, the, the champion for, for the underdog, because the big names, if you will, you know, they can they they've got their commercial space, right? So uh, I try to help the people out there who most people would probably not in all cases, but you know, I try to help the people who ordinarily would never get on commercial radio, and not because they're not good. It's just that sometimes commercial radio could be so confining in terms of what's going to be played and who's you know who's going to be played and who's going to be the the, the flavor of the month. Right. I think it's also it's perhaps useful at this point to talk about how you choose who you're going to interview, and mm. uh, it's a combination of people you're interested in and you know people that editors are willing to assign, uh, which are not always the same thing. Mm. And uh, you know, I there's certainly people I'm interested in who are not famous or uh, in vogue or however you want to say it. Um, but you know, I'm a free, I'm a freelance journalist, and I have to get paid for what I'm doing. So uh, I have to like uh, almost you know I usually don't interview anybody unless I have an assignment already in hand, uh, and so I can suggest things to an editor. But if they don't, if they're not interested, then I usually will um, say, well, what are you interested in? Um, <laughs> And you know, it's often you know, for me, it's a, it's a, it's you know, I'm a writer, so uh, for me to have a chance to, to write something, uh, and actually say something, is, uh, it's, it almost doesn't matter who I'm interviewing, as long as you know, I can find something to say about it. Who is your next uh, subject, Jeff? Um, well, I'm, I've done the interviews for a Maria Schneider story for Jazz Times that I have to write up this week. And then I'm interviewing some uh, Louisiana Creole Zydeco musicians uh, later this month. And, uh, I'm not sure what else is after that. Eddie, who's next on your plate? Uh, let me see. I've got a local musician, Ann Farnsworth. She's a, a vocalist uh, trying to help her get more exposure. Uh, she's well known in the LA area, but trying to help her get her because I have listeners, you know, people listen to my program as far as way, far away as New Zealand and so forth. Uh, that's the most uh, current one. We've been John Beasley uh, and, and Dougal Chankler. They were supposed to be on a couple of weeks ago because they're promoting a new CD. Uh, so we had to reschedule that because they had some um, schedule problems, and that's it that immediately comes to mind. So, but Eddie, do you you assign yourself interviews basically, oh. right? Yes, I do. Yes, yeah. uh, and it, it's a combination. Sometimes it's people uh, whom I'm just interested in, and other times publicists might call me if there's a new CD coming out. Uh, so it's a combination. But oftentimes, and sometimes I'll get emails from listeners, and mm -hmm. they'll ask me if I'll if I'll interview a particular 
a musician. So it's, there, it's are, a combination. Go ahead. Are there people you would like to interview that you can't get to, or if you want to interview somebody, can you usually get them on your show? It's only been one instance so far, and regretfully, you know, Donald Byrd just passed away, uh, right? Well, I use his, it, uh, Flight Time is my theme song, uh -huh. and I had, I just asked the wrong people, but I, I really, really want to interview him uh, because I've listened to his music since I was a kid, and plus right. I use his theme, uh, his song for my uh, theme, and I think, I think, Jeffrey, that's the only one. Everybody else I've been able to get connected to in one form or another. Have you had problems, Jeff, getting to people that you wanted to interview? Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes, especially in the pop world, you know, there, there are people who, you know, they, they, you know, they only do cover stories for certain magazines or whatever, you know. So, um, you, know, you, can't uh, force, you, can't, you can't force somebody to talk to you. <laughs> no, no, it's very difficult. I mean, one time I tried to interview George Benson before a show and he kept saying he didn't want to do it and I was able to somehow squirm my way into his dressing room and he kept saying, No, I'm not gonna do this and then he would say something that was interviewing you know, interviewee. Uh, and I turned on my equipment and he knew it. Uh, you know. And he let me talk to him for twenty minutes and he kept saying, No, we're not doing an interview, we're not doing it, we're not doing it. Uh, but the interview I mean that was a signed interview also. Uh, do you um do uh double interviews or round tables where you've uh, had to deal with three or four or five personalities at once? I haven't had to do that. I've done two people at once. I can't think I've done more than that. And do any of the artists use your interviews after they're completed and published or on the air, in Eddie's case, for their uh, own publicity purposes? I've had people uh, get clips of it for their websites. Is that a problem for you, or are you pleased? No, not at all. That, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. Well, Jeff, do you see pieces? Yeah, of I, I think so. It's like, um, especially if there's, a, there's a, if there's an Internet link, you know, it'll always, almost always show up on somebody's website. Um, if it only exists in print, that becomes more difficult for the website people. But, you know, you'll see stuff, you'll see stuff in press kits one way or the other. Somebody asked uh, whether we thought um, interviews had ex had had uh, expanded our careers and elevated our careers. In what way that had happened? And we've been able to take advantage of certain interviews that we did in order to uh, uh, progress ourselves. You want to take that on? You mean a particular uh, interview or just interviews in general? I, this wasn't really stipulated in the question, uh -huh. but answer any way you want. I think Jeff's case, Jeffrey's case, is probably different from mine in that, you know, this is his his, his full time gig, so to speak. In my case, uh, I'm actually teasing out some of these issues right now, so that I can transfer uh, transform some of these interviews, like I said earlier, into perhaps a certain uh, a text or a website. Uh, so that I could begin to generate income from these, because not right you now, right now it's not my full time work. Uh, it's something I love doing, and it just happens to fit in with my schedule. Uh, but I'm at that stage now where uh, I, I'm I have to do something and, and make these more commercial, uh, if you will, commercial in terms of generating income, not. Uh, doing something absolutely absurd. <laughs> yeah, well, the book idea is verging on the absolutely absurd, Eddie. I guess. That's what you can do it, but um, well, yeah, at um, least you know what I mean is something catalog, doing something with these. And there's a a, 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 um, a library that I've floated the idea. I have a huge, you know, I've got a big jazz collection, and I've floated the idea that I've gotten all these archives. I've got these CDs and albums and. You know, these are not going to fit in my coffin, man. <laughs> so uh, I want to make sure that they they, they go and in, in, that they that they're in the hands of someone who will pass them on, if you will, for the the, the good of the public. Quite right. That yeah, would be good. Um, are there uh, particular resources that you uh, go to for research? Do you look at the interviews of people um, who've already you know interviewed the interviewees 
so that you know what not to ask or you know what's already out there? Or? Yeah, if I have time, I, I keep folders on most artists. So uh, before I do an interview, I'll look at, uh, you know, I'll open up my folder and I'll read through, you know, stories from, you know, the last 10 or 20 years and you, you get a sense of how, how they talk just from reading other interviews, which is helpful in getting ready. You know, you also get lots of information. It makes you sound like you know what you're talking about. So mm -hmm. that's all useful. I'll, I'll do that, uh, do that, and then uh, sometimes I'll go to their websites too to find out if they're doing anything current. Right. You know, because I keep a file, like Jeffrey said, I'll keep a file of what's been done over the years. Uh, but sometimes I'll tip into the website to see if they've got something current that I can refer to as well. You know, yeah, that, that's useful too. And it's also useful to ask the publicist. I mean, publicists, you know, for, for as much as we all complain about them, can be very useful. You know, they can. Oh, absolutely. You, know, you can. You know, I always ask them, well, send me the information about what they're doing lately. You know, make sure I have the new record. You know, make, make sure I'm ready for the interview. So that you know. Uh, if they're doing their job, I help you prepare. Who do you think are some of the great interviewers? President yeah. Obama excluded, you mean? Yeah. No, no, we can't turn on ourselves. <laughs> who are the people who you modeled yourselves on? I was going to say Jeffrey, and Jeffrey was going to say Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me see. You want to tackle that one, Jeff? Let me think about this one. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of... There's a yeah. lot of good jazz writers right now. Um, I was thinking about some of the earlier. I hate to, I hate to name names because I'm going to leave somebody out that I shouldn't leave. Well, out. I'll, yeah. I'll say Nat Hentoff and Stanley Dance are mm -hmm. two people who I think are you know extremely good interviewers. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, Brett Delmage, by the way, says the link he sent is a good discussion on how to question subjects who evade questions, as was discussed earlier. Hopefully, uh -huh. something we don't have to do too often with jazz musicians. And he says Swatsky is a renowned Canadian investigative journalist, formerly from Ottawa. And then he goes on to say, and this will have to be our last question, what about interviewing people who aren't jazz musicians but who have had a huge influence, like funding administrators, <clears throat> festival managers, programmers, etc.? I do have flexibility with that, and I have done that before. Um, and the reason, in fact, when, they, when I was first asked to do the program, uh, and not in a pompous sense, but I said, you know, if you want somebody to just spin records, I'm not interested. But if you want the program to be a resource for the community, count me in. And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, yeah, I want to uh, obviously play the, the music, but I want to invite people in who ordinarily wouldn't get on commercial radio. also want people to come in and talk about resources. For example, I had a guest uh, a few years back that her organization – well, they help jazz. Every jazz musician doesn't have a 401k uh, plan or, uh, uh, for that matter, health insurance or vision insurance. So her organization uh, helped jazz artists out with those types of things. I had another uh, uh, interviewer, an interviewee who her organization helped, uh, it revolved around mental illness. So we, and that's a resource for the community, it's, it, it affects everybody, so we played music from jazz musicians who have had their various bouts, you know, with uh, mental illness or substance abuse, and then she talked about a program, so even though we do interviews sometimes, it, it, it's just, I don't talk in the entire hour, that, that's just, that just won't work, so things like that have been helpful for me. Jeff, have you done business people or grants? Yeah. You know, not a lot, but you know, I just did a big piece on Phil Shap uh, for uh, Jazz Times a few uh, m months ago, and you know, how'd you get him to talk? <laughs> 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 now, most of us know that Phil Shap is one of the people who is the most indomitable talkers in jazz. I think. Right. Hmm. He was not. Well, you know, he has, he has this reputation for like being, you know, you know very hard on people don't know as much about jazz as he does, which is kind of unfair because he knows more about jazz than anybody. But I found, you know, you know, once you started making, once you started cracking jokes with each other, it, it relaxed and it was, it was a great interview. Uh-huh. Well, that's good. Um, can't wait to see that one. Is it already out? Yeah, it came out a, a while ago. Yeah. Do you guys uh, promote your interviews, Eddie, in your case, 
before you're going to do it? Do you go on social media and let people know about it? Yes, I'll do uh, Facebook, and then I'm on these various email blasts. Uh, uh, and I'll just I put it out there, uh, and that's pretty much it. But yeah, I do utilize all the uh, social media outlets. And Jeff, do you uh, let people know when you've published something? And you know? Um, you know, I let my friends know, but uh, I mean, I think that's the magazine's job. <laughs> uh -huh. Not your Facebook friends, huh? Well, my Facebook friends, but I. That's only, you know, I don't have 3,000 Facebook friends like some people. Oh, we'll have to get you. That's easy to get you. We'll do that. Uh, uh, maybe that will be the topic of the next uh, yeah, webinar, uh, how to get Facebook friends. Um, anyway, we are at the time, the allotted time to sign off on this. And thank you for letting me interview you two guys to, today. Eddie Beck and Jeff Himes, uh, it's been a pleasure. And... Uh, the Jazz Journalists Association is working next on a huge uh, media campaign to raise profile of International Jazz Day and uh, um, Jazz Appreciation Month by virtue of the kinds of activities that are going on in local communities. So we want local people, you all who are listening, attending this webinar, to think about ways in which you can turn media on to the things going on around you, especially during April and leading up to Jazz Appreciation Day on April 30th. Uh, you'll all be getting emails about this uh, campaign from the JJA. Hopefully you'll take a good look at them. Um, if you want information about the Jazz Journalists Association, which you don't know much about, uh, go to jjanews.org, and uh, that's sort of our public face. Of course, we love people to join the Jazz Journalists Association. And I think um, next month, I think we're going to actually have our um, webinar about how uh, musicians and record reviewers are interacting over uh, digital downloads, if that's a good way to get people uh, music better than hard copy or worse. Mm. Uh, that, that's, that's Jason Wong, the violinist, is working with me on that, and we should have some more information about that soon. So again, I want to thank Eddie Beckton, I want to thank Jeff Himes, um, Howard Manda, we want to thank Joanne Kaywell, who's been behind the scenes working on the uh, technical element of this, and thank all of you attendees, and we hope we see you uh, in the cloud or online uh, Jazz Journals Association events in the future. Thanks for checking in. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Howard. Thanks, Howard. Nice to meet you, Jeffrey. Bye. Thanks, Joanne. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.